The hands that first held Mary's child were hard from working wood. From boards they sawed and planed and filed and splinters they withstood. This day they gripped no tool of steel, they drove no iron nail, but cradled from the head to heel. Our Lord, newborn and frail. When Joseph marveled at the size of that small breathing frame, and gazed upon those bright new eyes and spoke the infant's name. The angel's words he once had dreamed poured down from heaven's height. And like the stars a host that be Blessed earth with welcome light. This child shall be Emmanuel, not God upon the throne, but God with us. Emmanuel, as close as blood and bone, the tiny form in Joseph's palms confirmed what he had heard, and from his heart rose hymns and songs for heaven's human. The tools that Joseph laid aside, a mob would later lift and use with anger, fear, and pride to crucify God's gift. Let us, O oh Lord, not only hold a child who's born today, but charge with faith, let us be bold to follow in his way. Thank you for that. I very much appreciate the music this morning, and I hope you recognize in these hymns that we're singing, these Christmas hymns, uh, they have such deep theology. Not a lot of Christmas songs that you hear on the station have it, but if you listen to the Christmas carols and read the words, there's a lot of deep theology that teaches us the truth of life, so so thankful for that. Take your Bibles this morning, if you would, and turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, and as you're turning, we'll dismiss the children, four years old to fourth grade, if you'll head on out this morning. Thank the Campbells for uh, teaching them this month. They've done a wonderful job, and today they're learning the Christmas story once again, so be in prayer for our children as they leave, that they would recognize the truth of Christmas. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6 comes a 
uh, a prophecy hundreds of years before Jesus' birth. Isaiah prophesied of the coming child. And we see here in verse 6 an interesting statement and title given to this baby, but we also, what I'd like to focus on this morning is the following verse which teaches us some very, well, it, it teaches us what's going on now. And I hope we have hearts to recognize and see that. Luke, or excuse me, Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us is born, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. We'll end our reading right there from Isaiah 9. So here in Isaiah comes the prophecy of Christ's birth, but also the prophecy of his rule and that his government would increase and so also would his peace. Take your Bibles now and turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, part of our scripture reading this morning, the Advent scripture of what the angels had to say, you can see, starting there in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. So the prophecy came that a child was coming, that he would be the prince of peace, and that this peace would be increasing. So in Luke 2 and verse 8, we have the beginning of that fulfillment. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock, flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill, Toward men. We have the prophecy from Isaiah. We have the fulfillment here this night in Bethlehem. And what I'd like to focus on this morning in our thoughts is the fact that Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And then it says this as the Prince of Peace, his government shall be ever increasing, and so shall the peace that he brings of his government. And of his peace there shall be no end. Of the increase of his government and of his peace there shall be no end. The continual increase of his domain and the peace that he brings will continue to build and increase. And so this morning in preparation for Christmas, I'd like us to meditate on the idea of the fulfillment of the promise of increasing peace. Peace is the last word that I would use, of course, to describe America right now, right? I mean, this last week, as we view the hardworking aspects of Washington, you've had a great calm and peace come over you, right? Yeah, right. You don't know what, you read one and, and uh, you know, you, we have such a split society right now and, and, and one would throw, throw him out and the other would keep him there and, and proclaim his goodness and innocence and and as believers, of course, we say, well, this is not my home. Thank the Lord. But peace is the last word I would use to describe the current government climate. I would also use it, would not use it to, to uh, characterize our social climate. If you're following what's happening in Virginia, their government is getting, in Virginia is getting ready to put in certain firearms bans. So then they, people in Virginia have proclaimed their city as a sanctuary city for those who would carry. And one of the sheriffs has said, as soon as they tell us that we have to give up our weapons or not have certain kinds of weapons, I will then deputize anybody who needs to carry. It's crazy. We're, we're not in a time of peace, are we? No, we're in a time of great conflict. Peace is the last word I would use when thinking about the moral climate of our country as well, right? I mean, do, do Christians still care about morality? Are we passionate about the holiness of God? 
Or has morality become a, ah, you know, this is what you believe and this is what I believe? And less about who God really is. And yet, as we gather here today and celebrate the, the birth of the Prince of Peace that happened over 2,000 years ago, we're celebrating the increase of His peace because it shall have no end, right? What were the angels speaking of that night years ago when the glory of the Lord shone round about? What was the peace they were talking about? Well, let me tell you what peace they were not talking about. They were not talking about national peace, right? Peace on earth. What, what kind of climate, political climate, did Jesus come into? Peace? Well, there was a sense of peace in the fact that Rome, and he, Rome held everybody underneath its thumb. But there was no peace for Israel in that sense. There was no nationalistic peace. They wanted to throw off Rome. Of course, today we don't have that nationalistic peace we're very bifurcated. Social peace, was that what is talked about? No, every society has had conflict. Every social institution has conflict. They say that even among Christian marriages, divorce rate is up above 50%. Where's the peace that was promised in the Prince of Peace? Was it an economic peace? Ah, right? On the contrary, money becomes one of the greatest dividers. So what is this peace? Is it just the absence of conflict? We would say absolutely not. What is the peace that the Prince of Peace brings and ever increases? And do you have it? And do we have it? Well, first of all, I want to, we're going to jump around to a lot of scriptures today, so I hope you'll stay with me that way. But first of all, I want us to see that the Prince of, bring, the Prince of Peace brings peace with God. Peace with God. This is the peace that is spoken of that night by the angels. And let me just say, don't get caught up in the superficial proclamation of peace on earth, goodwill to men, that is used around the holiday season. As if no one watches the news at night or reads what's going on. Men cry, peace, peace, but what? There's no peace. Why? Why is there no peace? There's no peace because there's something called enmity. Enmity with God. Warfare with God. We read it this morning. Pastor read it this morning from James 4. What? Know you not that friendship with the world is what? It's warfare with God. Anyone who will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. To the Jews, Jeremiah writes in, in Jeremiah 21.5, about God. God is speaking. He says, I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and therefore will be a friend of the world. Oh, sorry. With a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. This is God speaking to the Israelites. He says, I am against you. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. If we read verses 10 and, and following, we're going to see why we are in such turmoil and how we can have peace. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10 says this, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of their way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their way. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, now that sounds a little bit more like today, doesn't it? That is a pretty good description. The way of peace they have not known. And we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may be guilty before God. Here's the problem. Man is at war against God. There is warfare going on. A 
cannot be peace when there is warfare with God. The peace that man needs is so much greater than peace with one another. Man desperately needs peace with his maker. This is the promise that was fulfilled at Christmas. That there could be peace with God. Jesus is the Prince of Peace and he brings with him peace with God. What is amazing about Christmas is that God does not allow us to stay in a relationship of enmity and warfare. He spans that gap. He comes to the enemy. He comes to us and he offers to us a way of knowing peace. Romans says in chapter 5, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8 of chapter 5, But God commendeth or demonstrateth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from what? Wrath. You see, man is at warfare against God, and God's wrath is on man. But God comes to man and brings to them the Prince of Peace and offers through his death peace. Peace with God. This is why Romans chapter 5 and verse 1 is such a beautiful passage of Scripture when it tells us that we are justified by faith. Those who are justified, those who have placed their faith in the work of Jesus Christ, have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Peace. Jesus is our peace. He satisfies God's wrath through payment. He fulfills justice by living a perfect life and then by becoming the infinite substitutionary sacrifice. And through His death, He brings to us something called reconciliation. Reconciliation, the idea that two groups are at warfare, but something has happened to bring them back into a beneficent relationship. 2 Corinthians 5.18, it says this, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19 says this, To wit, or because God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. God comes to man who is at war against him and, and sacrifices himself to bring us to himself in a peaceful relationship. God took the initiative to bring the promised peace to those who are at war against him. And he did it by coming to earth as a child, living perfect, a perfect life, and then offering that on our behalf. Peace with God requires a cessation of wrath, and that is why Jesus came. But let's think about this. What is the priority? How important is this peace, this peace with God? It is the most fundamental and basis, basic aspect of all peace. If we're ever going to have peace with one another, we must first have peace with God. You cannot experience any kind of lasting peace until you are at peace with your maker. Nothing can properly function while disregarding the operator and his manual. I mean, fathers, we're getting ready to put together some things, right? For our kids. And the instructions usually come. But I tell you what, if you disregard the instructions and do it your own way, you might mess it up. If you have any mechanical ability like me, you won't even get into the box, right? The way they lock these toys down inside the cardboard, that's just, if I could just get it out of there first. But think about it. God created man. God knows how man operates. God knows what brings peace. God knows what fulfills man. God knows man better than man knows man. And if man rejects his maker, he rejects the pathway to peace. To war against God is futile. God withholds peace from man. For the express purpose of bringing man to himself. 
Have you thought about that? God withholds peace from man so that we will understand that we have a maker and we depend upon him. That's why you'll never find peace while running from God. And I say that not just to those who don't know Christ, but to those who know Christ. If you run from God, if you run from his will, if you run from his word, you run away from peace. Think about Jonah, right? All Jonah wanted was what? Peace. No, God, I can't go there. I don't want to go there. They're bad, and I will not have peace if you work in their city. I will not have peace if I go there. So Jonah takes his own ship away from God, and what happens? You can't run from God. Then he runs into a storm. And he runs into a whale and he runs into the sun and the desert and a worm. And he runs into all these things that God creates just to bring him back to himself and say, listen, if you want peace, I'm the one who gives it. The one thing Jonah wanted, he could have had through simple obedience. Think about the book of Ecclesiastes. If you haven't read the book of Ecclesiastes, I would encourage you to do it, especially as we come into a new year. Ecclesiastes between December 26th and January 1st, appropriate. New Year's resolutions galore, right? Because here's a man, King Solomon, who had everything that this world said would bring peace. And he says what? When he finally comes to the fruit of what the world's tree offers, he reaches for it. And what does he say it is? It's nothing. It's it's vanity, it's smoke, it's, I reach for it and it's gone. Ecclesiastes is the illustration of how God will let a man explore every fruitless path to peace and come up missing. And the point of Ecclesiastes is this, there is no point to seeking after peace if you reject the Prince of Peace. The need is because man is at war with God. The priority is because you will not have peace in any aspect of your life until you have peace with God. And the glory of it, think about this, the glory of God in this peace. The night that angels proclaim glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men, they weren't just putting two phrases that don't have anything to do with each other together. In fact, the glory of God has a lot to do with peace. The glory to God, God brings peace. Seeking God's glory also brings peace. God is glorified when men are at peace with him. God is glorified when men are at peace with him because of the goodwill he shows in Jesus Christ. God has chosen to glorify himself by giving Jesus Christ to man to bring man to himself in a redeemed, justified, and reconciled relationship. Let me ask you this morning. Do you have peace with God? Do you have peace with God to the point when you lay your head down on your pillow at night, there is peace and rest? Do you know if you're right with God, then everything can go wrong and you're right with God. When forgiveness, the forgiveness that God brings through Christ is understood and, and applied to the heart and to the mind, there is such peace. Of course you're a sinner. Of course you struggle. Of course you fall short. But that is why Christ came. To bring you to God in peace. And you know, it, 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 is a, it is a proud thing for me to lie in bed and figure out if I've been good enough. It is a glorifying thing to lay in bed and thank God for his complete and free forgiveness. Are you at peace with God? Does death scare you? If death scares you, maybe there's not peace with God. 
And I would even go beyond that. Is the death of loved ones more scary than your own death? For me, I'm planning to burn out pretty quick, but uh, Lord, keep me around to help my wife with the kids. But you know what? God has brought peace to them. God is the bringer of peace to them, not me. And I need to hand them to God and have the peace of God that comes when I trust in his forgiveness for my children. Do you have peace this morning? Peace with God. You see, the Prince of Peace not only brings peace with God, but he brings peace with self. Peace with self. Are you at peace with yourself? Now, don't throw me out of the pulpit here, okay? I'm not going progressive in that sense. What is peace with self? I'll tell you this. God has written on every human heart his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. And the conscience bears witness to the Creator. And I don't care what you proclaim yourself as or what the, my neighbor proclaims himself as or, or, or Richard Dawkins proclaims himself as, God has written on his mind and on his heart as eternal Godhead and power. And that man is without excuse. And he is not at peace with himself while resisting what God has written on his heart. The unbeliever cannot be at peace with self. He may seek to deny it. He may seek to avoid it. He may seek to drown it in a substance. However, his creator has written on his heart that he will stand before and answer to God. And if you don't know that Christ stands for you, there is no peace with self. And there is always the nagging of, what if I'm wrong? What happens after death if we're not at peace with god we cannot be at peace with self think about the words of john chapter 3 and verse 36 he that believeth on the son have ever, hath everlasting life and he believeth not on the son shall not see life but the wrath of god abides on him a man who has the wrath of god abiding on him cannot be at peace with god obviously but because he's the creator that man cannot be at peace with himself Once again, we realize that warfare with God, the creator of man and the giver of peace, is to deny the source of peace. However, for the believer, for the believer, there is a confidence in your standing before God. There is a peace with our maker and a reassurance that apart from the unrest of the day, I am forgiven. I am guaranteed acceptance with God and there is a place for me. In heaven. And you can lie down on your bed at night, no matter the conflict of the day, and have rest. God gives his redeemed rest because they're right with him. I love Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, There is therefore now no what? No condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus, and he hath made us free from the law of sin and death. And when I lay down at night, and when I think through things in my mind, and when I hash out my inconsistencies, and my struggles, and my sins, and my weaknesses, as I do that, I know there's a Savior who says, no condemnation. I've taken that. And there's peace. Regardless of the political atmosphere, regardless of the economic status or the family drama or the work environment, there is a peace that one has that God gives, and it is absolutely internal. The peace that comes to grow through a knowledge of God and his promises, this peace increases as the heart and mind are set on things above. Here's what I love. The increase of God's peace is directly tied to the knowledge of the Prince of Peace. And as you come to know the Prince of Peace, and as he rules in your mind and in your heart, there is an ever-increasing work of peace. 
If you're at conflict today, God has an answer for that. Think about it. The effects of peace with self are, are pervasive spiritually, right? There's a maturity, there's a growth, there's a completeness, the Bible says, that comes to the believer that allows the struggles of daily life to cause them to hope in God. Where is your hope? I would say that the political climate is wonderful for the church, right? Because your hope shouldn't be in Washington. And, and though I appreciate certain policy making, if it can be done, it can be undone, right? I mean, Trump is on a war path to undo everything that Obama did. And what do you think that sets us up for? Somebody come back through and try to undo everything he's done. And we're going to play seesaw. And if your emotions and your hope is set on that seesaw, you're going to be up and down and you're going to be a mess. And you're going to look at Facebook and you're going to get angry at people. Right? And you're going to wonder, why did I bring kids into this world when it's such turmoil? But those who know God, those who are growing in their understanding of the Savior are spiritually at peace. But spiritual peace pours over into mental peace. And the Prince of Peace rules in the heart and in the mind. And as he rules in your heart and mind, peace is the result. Listen to these verses. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. What's next? Whose mind is stayed, anchored, bolted, to Jesus Christ. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, complete peace, when the mind of the believer is stayed on Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We did that this morning, right? Did you do that this morning as we prayed? And then it says this, and the peace of God that passes understanding shall keep your heart and mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh. Spiritual peace, this growing relationship with Jesus Christ, pours over into the physical aspects of the mind and the heart, and it keeps us grounded. And by the way, I'm not a doctor, but spiritual peace... When you mix spiritual peace with mental peace, there is an effect on the body. And we know this because as we read the Bible, we see what happens when David rejects Christ's way, rejects God's way, goes his, after his own glory and his own way, and then he writes these beautiful psalms about his body just being wrapped with pain and misery. Now, I want to be careful. I'm not going against doctors and medicine, but I'm going to say this. The body is physical. The, the, the spirit is spiritual, but there's a way they come together, and it's the mind, right? And I would say this. Mental health is very important, but mental health is only found through spiritual health. You can be fit as a fiddle and racked with anxiety. And it will take its toll. Now I'll tell you this, if you seek after physical health, you're going about it the wrong way. Seek after spiritual health and mental health, and you'll find that God will use physical suffering to drive your peace even deeper. Ugh. Isn't this what the Bible teaches? And so we're not to be anxious for anything, but we're to let the word of God take hold of our minds and give us a peace that passes all understanding. Psalm 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law and, what's the next word? Nothing shall offend them. Now, the word offend doesn't mean like getting ticked off. Okay. Okay. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall cause them to stumble. Nothing shall cause them to lose faith. Nothing will come and throw them off. 
You know why? Because when there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, and while there's a growing knowledge of God, the King of Peace, the Prince of Peace, causes the, the ruling of your heart and mind to increase in peace. And so when Isaiah stands up and says, of the increase of his government and of his peace, there shall be no end, we as believers say, amen to that. I know that. I know that. It's increasing. It's not where I want it, but it's increasing as I come to know him. You see, the glory of God is found in this peace with self. How does one go about seeking peace with self? Well, the world would tell you that it comes from from. Well, let's just quote every Disney movie ever made, you know? Trust your heart, love yourself, blah, 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 right? That is how the world says you come to inner peace is by looking inside. But when you look inside, there's warfare with God. And there's consequences of that, so we don't look to self. How do I seek peace with self? It is not by fulfilling my own needs first, It's this, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. As you you follow after the glory of God, there is an amazing benefit. It's called peace. It's called peace. If you are going to be at peace with self, it will only come when you seek the glory of God by knowing and obeying God. It is amazing how this works and how easily it can be forfeited. You see, when I put Mark Rowland as the Prince of Peace and try to rule for his glory, the last thing that people experience or that I gain is peace. And all workers at Calvary Christian School said, Amen. I mean, come on, you know it. You know that when we seek after our own way, when we go away from the glory of God to seek our own kingdoms, the last thing that happens is peace. But when we seek after God, Isaiah 32, 17 says, And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. Think about it. The work of righteousness, that would be seeking God's glory shall be peace. And the effects of seeking God's glory will be quietness and confidence. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what has been offered to us through Jesus Christ? Of the increase of God's peace, or if the increase of God's peace is going to be ever expanding in his kingdom, then under his rule is where I will find peace. On the converse, I will live in constant turmoil when I place myself on the throne. Oh, didn't we read that this morning? James chapter 4. It was kind of an odd Christmas passage, right? Whence come war, wars and fightings among you? Oh, come they not from your own lusts? You desire to have. In fact, you'll go as far as killing to get what you want. And this is why there's no peace. And as we read later on in that passage, it says this. God resisteth the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Prince of Peace has brought peace with God, but he's also brought peace with self. And you know that we're not done, right? Because the Prince of Peace also brings peace with others. In its proper order, the Prince of Peace brings an increase of peace among those who know him and he rules those he rules over. Peace with others can only come as a result of of peace with God, right? I cannot be right with God if I am at war with my brother. We we see Jesus teaching this. He says, leave your gift at the altar and be right. Don't say that you can come and be right with God while you know you're in turmoil with your brother. The two go hand in hand. 
be right with God by being right with your brother. Man cries for peace with one another but cannot attain it. But think about this. Think about the increasing knowledge of God, the increasing knowledge of his goodness and his sovereignty, and how peace comes as a result of that. Peace with others. Oh, we have a wonderful example. His name is Jesus. A man who came and was at peace with God, and because he was at peace with God, he could be at peace with others. You say, wait a second, Jesus wasn't at peace with others? Listen to these verses. John 13 and verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put in the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from God and that he went to God, what did he do? He rises up from supper, lays aside his garments, and takes a towel and girds himself. And after that, he poured water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Oh, do you see it? Jesus Christ knew the Father. He knew the plan of God. He was right with God. And because of that, it did not matter what the other was doing. It didn't matter even that Judas, the betrayer of our, of our Lord, our perfect Lamb of God, was sitting at that table. Jesus, knowing God and being convinced of his sovereignty and his plan and the glory of his Father, puts on a towel and washes the disciples' feet. That is peace with God, peace with self, demonstrated in peace with others. We see it again in 1 Peter 2, 22. It says this, speaking of Jesus, says, Who did no sin? Neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But listen, he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And he goes to the cross. And he suffers murder by the hands of wicked men. But why did he do that? He did that because he knew the Father. He trusted him. He knew that he was, he, was doing the, he was pursuing the glory of God. He was at peace with himself, if we could say it that way. And because of that, he was able to offer his life as a sacrifice to people who did not deserve it. Let me ask you this. This morning, you recognize very quickly that God has brought peace with God. There's a struggle applying that to life and figuring out how to be at peace with self because we are proud people who would love to pay for our own sins instead of trusting in complete forgiveness. And then by that time, by the time we get to other people, hey, have you not been out in the holiday traffic? Right? I mean, come on. Peace, listen, Peace with man does not mean men treat me the way I want to be treated. Peace with man means that I trust God and lay it all on his shoulders and go out and serve those around me. Too often we wait for people to treat us the way we want to be treated before we can feel at peace. And God says, that's not how it works. Trust that I know the end from the beginning. Make yourself a doormat. Wow. If I make myself a doormat, people are going to step on me, right? Are you at peace with that? That's the example of our Savior, and he calls us to follow that example because when we know the glory of God, we rejoice to follow it. But let's just end this way. Peace becomes the, should become the identifying mark of the church, right? Right? Peace should become the identifying mark of the church. The increase of God's rule in the heart of believers increases the peace that God brings through Christ to each believer. And so Philippians 2, 
the, the, the passage about Jesus coming to earth, the theological passage that talks about what he did, it's where we should be living with one another, right? In fact, the whole passage starts this way. If there be any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any bowels of mercy, if you're the church and you've experienced love for God or God's love for you, then fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, right? And then he goes on and he says that we need to be of lowly mind, thinking little of ourselves and taking on the concerns of one another. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? And then it talks about how Jesus Christ, the God of glory, steps away from that position, right? He thought it, he, glory with God was not something that he grasped after. He, he is God, and yet he gave it up and came to earth. And he lived on this earth in a way that, that is shameful to humanity. He came unto his own, and his own would not receive him. And yet, he followed and he sought the Father's will. And because of that, because of that, he has redeemed to himself a church that should follow in his footsteps. The church should be a place of peace. Remember what what uh, Ephesians says, that Jesus is our peace and has broken down the middle wall of partition so that people from Brazil and people from America and people from Israel and, and people from every tribe and tongue and nation could gather together in one accord, seeking the glory of one God, having one faith, and being at peace with one another. Oh, that Calvary Bible Church would be a proclaimer of peace on earth. A growing peace because we have peace with God who has brought peace with self so that we can be at peace with one another. The Prince of Peace, his government, his rule in your heart should be increasing. And through the increase of his government, there will be an increasing peace and it will have no end. And by the way, there is coming a day, right? There's coming a day when, when the presence of sin will be put away. And we'll stand with Jesus Christ in his very presence, and there will be total peace. I look forward to that day. As we go today, let's remember that there is a Christmas promise for us in the prophet Isaiah. This child will have a continual Increase of his government and rule, and that rule will continually bring an increasing peace. And let's rejoice with the angels as we understand that Jesus is the ruler who gives peace to those who know him. But let's take it a step further as we leave, and let's realize that as Jesus Christ rules in our hearts and in our minds through the knowledge of his revealed word, peace increases as we seek his glory. Do you want increased peace? Do you know Christ as your Savior? Is his knowledge increasing in your heart and mind and keeping it at peace? It's the promise of Scripture. If you say, no, I am struggling, I would ask you this question, as I have had to ask myself many times over the past week, Am I seeking God's glory? Am I seeking God's glory? For in that, the peace of God is found. Are you seeking God's glory? Glory to God in the highest. And peace, goodwill to men. Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I would just ask you this morning, do you know Christ, the Prince of Peace? Do you know him in such a way that your heart is at rest when you think about death? That if you were to die today, it's taken care of. I will stand with God free from sin, free from guilt. Are you at peace with your creator? If you are not at peace with God, would you accept the gift of Jesus Christ 
His life and his death were for you. That through just trusting in him, through trusting in him, you would receive eternal life. I would say this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, please don't go today without asking, at least asking the question, what does that mean? The pastors here would love to speak with you about what that means. Believer, you say you have trusted in Jesus Christ. Is peace ruling in your heart? A peace that, that passes understanding and is such a testimony to the world as the church gathers together. Are you at peace with God? Are you seeking His will? Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice in our Savior, Jesus Christ. We rejoice in that sanctifying work which He does through the Word of God. Lord, we thank you that one day we will shed this shell of sin-cursed flesh and we will stand with you in your presence. And as we stand with you in your presence, there will be absolute peace across all areas of life. So Lord, while we continue through this life, we pray that we would seek your glory and that through seeking your glory, we would know your peace. Lord, we pray that this church would have a testimony to our community, not of conflict or of pride, but a testimony of peace with one another. Lord, I pray this morning that as your word has fallen on our minds, we would not leave it here, but that we would take it with us, that we would look up these passages, that we would, we would question the peace that you have promised, and that we would come to know you. Lord, I pray that through our knowledge of you, you would impress upon our hearts a deeper desire for more knowledge. And we thank you ahead of time for the peace that comes as we come to know you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.